All right, welcome back. Um, in this lecture, uh, I'm going to cover archaea. And so yesterday we covered bacteria. We went through characteristics of bacteria, uh, structure of bacteria, how do they obtain energy, and a few other special features on bacteria. And you had an assignment where you had to color the prokaryotic sheets. Um, and so here we go with archaea. I'm actually going to start off this lecture a little bit different. I came across a book in the library called Death in Yellowstone, and it was titled Accidents of Foolhardiness in the First National Park. And each chapter is dedicated to a way that you could die in Yellowstone. Like number one, hold fast to your children, death in hot water. Uh, chapter two, these animals are not real, the myth that can kill you. Uh, down to noxious fumes and a, and a death from poisonous gas. Lying in the snow, deaths from avalanches and freezing, uh, caves, cave in, missiles from above, fallen rocks. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you could die in Yellowstone. And this book out here, you know, does a great job describing all the ways you can die in Yellowstone. Now, why am I talking about death in Yellowstone? Well, I'm going to read an excerpt uh, from this book. Starting right here. While the men looked at the hot springs, Ratliff's dog, Moosey, a large mastiff or Great Dane, escaped from the vehicle and jumped into a nearby C Celestine pool. Celestine pool, sorry. A hot spring later measured at 202 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty hot. 212 is boiling. The dog began yelping, and someone nearby quipped, Oh, look, the poor thing. Kerwin and Ratliff rushed to the spring and stood on the edge of it. Ratliff and another bat bystander both saw Kerwin was preparing to go into the spring and the bystander yelled don't go in there Kerwin yelled back like hell I won't several more people yelled not to go in but Kerwin took two steps into the pool then dove head first into the boiling water one witness described it as a flying swimming pool type dive Visitor Earl Welch of Anastobe, Alabama, saw Kerwin actually swim to the dog and attempt to take it to shore, go completely underwater again, then release the dog and began trying to climb out. Ronald Ratliff pulled Kerwin from the spring, sustained a second-degree burns to his feet. Welch saw Kerwin appear to stagger backwards, so the visitor hastened to him and said, Give me your hand. Kerwin offered his hands, and Welch directed, Come to the sidewalk. As they moved slowly toward the walk, Kerwin managed to say, That was stupid. How bad am I? Welch tried to reassure him. And before they reached the walkway, Kerwin again spoke softly. That was a stupid thing I did. Welch was suddenly overwhelmed with the feeling that he was walking with a corpse. He could see that Kerwin's entire body was badly burnt as the skin was already peeling off. It seemed to Welch that Kerwin was blind, for his eyes appeared totally white. Another man ran up, began to remove one of Kerwin's shoes, and the men watched horrified as the skin came off from it. Don't do that, said Welch, and Kerwin responded very tiredly. It doesn't matter. Near the spring, rangers found two large pieces of skin shaped like human hands. Kerwin experienced third degree burns over 100% of his body, including his entire head. I don't know how you can go over 100%, but whatever. He was taken to the clinic at Old Faithful, where a burn specialist who was coincidentally on duty could do little for him other than to pump IV fluids at a high rate. Bob Carnes, a ranger who saw him at the clinic, remembers thinking that Kerwin did not have a chance for survival. He was blind and most of his skin was coming off. Ratlet's dog died in the pool and was not rescued. Oils from his body later made the hot spring have small eruptions. Kerwin died the following morning in a Salt Lake City hospital. In the men's truck, rangers found the park's warning literature and pamphlets. Kerwin and Ratliff had not read any of them. The idea of being boiled to death in a hot spring is a truly terrifying one to any rational person. Notwithstanding the Billings Gazette editorial at the beginning of this book, hot spring deaths have occurred much more commonly in Yellow National, Yellowstone National Park than have grizzly bear deaths. The park has around 10,000 hot springs, geysers, mud pots, and steam vents scattered over its mountain plateau. Though collectively called thermal features today, all are technically hot springs. Most are hotter than 150 degrees Fahrenheit, and many reach temperatures of 185 to 205 degrees Fahrenheit. Water boils at around 198 degrees Fahrenheit at this elevation. These hot springs are dramatic and ex exquisitely beautiful features that are also very dangerous. Out of 19 known human deaths from hot springs in Yellowstone, seven have been children. Generally, these children were not being closely supervised by their parents in dangerous thermal areas at the times of their deaths. Because children are often oblivious to dangers around them, it is imperative that parents watch them closely in the park. Um, so here's a... Uh, a pool that's very similar to the Celestine Celestine pool. Um, you can see that it's boiling, okay? And it's this beautiful, vibrant blue color. Take a look at these pictures. Animal bones and the hot spring, okay? Dead trees and mammoth hot springs. So my question to you is if the waters of Yellowstone are so deadly, 
do you think anything could survive in them? And the answer is yes. This is a perfect example, okay? This is the Grand Prismatic Spring found in Yellowstone National Park. Um, you can see that it's this, this kind of rainbow color, this dark blue, and it just kind of ranges out. And the hottest part is smack dab in the center. And as you reach the edge of the pools, uh, it gets a little bit cooler. And each color that you see is a species of archaea uh, that thrive in that environment. Table and Urbanski, please come down to the office. Table and Urbanski, please come down to the office. Thank you. All right, so I have a short video here. Yellowstone has half of all the known geysers in the world, around 300 in all. Here, at the Clipsidra geyser, cold water flows into tight crevices in Yellowstone's molten core and explodes into steam. Clepsidra has been erupting almost continuously since 1959. Its plumes of water can reach up to 40 feet making it one of Yellowstone's most reliable and photographed sites. But the meeting of water and hot stone here doesn't always bring such explosive results. Nearby, the calm waters of the Excelsior Crater seem to invite the unwary for a swim. But don't be fooled. That beautiful blue color means the water is so hot, not even the hardiest bacteria can survive. This same deadly blue lies at the center of what is, without doubt, one of nature's most amazing sights. A place that alone lures thousands of people from around the world to Yellowstone. It's known as the Grand Prismatic Spring. This is the largest hot spring in the U.S and the third largest in the world. Its blue core may be deadly, but the colorful cooler bands at its edges are evidence that the Grand Prismatic is also home to plenty of life. Each band supports a unique bacteria or algae that creates a color of its own. When visitors on the boardwalk of the Grand Prismatic cross patterns that look like giant flames, they are stepping over descendants of some of the earliest forms of life on Earth microbes, called thermophiles, or heat lovers, thrive in extreme environments like the waters of Grand Prismatic Spring. There are literally billions of these tiny orange-colored microbes here. So many, they create dramatic flame-like patterns that look like a work of art that was painted by Mother Nature herself. Getting a chance to experience this colorful, steaming cauldron is why many come to Yellowstone in the first place. But there's nothing like seeing it all from the air. Okay. So I found this quote. Nothing ever conceived by human art could equal the peculiar vividness and delicacy of color of these remarkable prismatic springs. Life becomes a privilege and a blessing after one has seen and thoroughly felt these incomparable types of nature's cunning skill. Um, so... Like I said, there are some organisms that do thrive in extreme environments. And in that video, they call them thermophiles or heat loving um, organisms. And these organisms are called archaea. And uh, each color, okay, um, represents kind of a temperature change and a new organism occupying that temperature, kind of like a bambushka doll, where it's uh, layer upon layer or doll within doll. Um, so hardly you know any living thing lives in the center but then as you edge out where the water cools uh, now you start to see um, you know that there are some organisms that can thrive in those hot conditions so archaea uh, is very similar to bacteria okay first off they are both considered prokaryotes no nucleus or organelles right they have a cell wall not like bacteria but they do have a cell wall and their DNA is circular. Um, differences to bacteria is that the ribosomes of archaea are similar to eukaryotes, not prokaryotes. Their plasma membrane is different. Um, here is bacteria and, and eukarya, where we have a lipid bilayer, remember our cell membrane, two, two phospholipids. Um, with archaea, they are one-layered, 
they are continuous. There's no break down here. And the big difference between archaea and bacteria is that they live in extreme environments. So here are some examples of extreme uh, environments, extreme salt levels, extreme ha uh, ha halophils. They love salt. They live in very salty water, such as ponds in San Francisco Bay, California. The water in the bay looks red because these archaea make red pigments. Hyperthermophiles. Hyperthermophiles love high heat. They live in very hot water, such as the nearly, nearly boiling water of hot springs in Yellowstone National Park. Acidophiles love acid. They live in very acidic environments, such as acid mine drainage. Some can even survive in environments with negative pH values. Many are also hyperthermophilic. Uh, now, why is this important? Okay, who cares? Who cares that we can find organisms at the bottom of the seafloor in a hot spring in Yellowstone, underneath a subglacial lake in Antarctica, or even in a hot air desert? Well, it does matter because these, th this is life. And there are places outside of Earth, somewhere else in the universe, that have these identical conditions. And there could be life there. So one um, case of of life that you know that we think might be a good spot where life could exist is a moon of Jupiter called Europa and here's Jupiter and Jupiter's got like over 63 moons but there's one moon called Europa and it is covered in ice okay and uh, it's not solid all the way through because of of tidal pressures from Jupiter um, so we have this cold brittle ice layer on top a warmer soft ice and there's heat uh, in the center of Europa because of these the, the tidal pressures from Jupiter and as a result we could um, you know theoretically we think that there's an ocean here and if there's water uh, you know water is a good good indicator that maybe life could exist uh, there so when we study archaea and bacteria you know we're trying to apply it outside of earth you know maybe that is the form of life that we could discover um, elsewhere. All right, so that does it for section 7.1.